So Tom, how do you fit, because you're an accountant, you're a chartered accountant, and yet you find theater seats in small southwestern Ontario towns. You go to your friends and raise 40 to 50. You go and do the lip grant. You I, climb I, into I, your windows and find buildings with Shane Jaffe. How does your life as the, the accountant part of Tom, who keeps great books, and all the artistic side of Tom, how do they fit? Well, I, there, they did uh, uh, an off-Broadway show uh, made up of songs I had written for Satyricon. And it was called uh, Dr. C'est La Vie's Magic Theater. It was a big hit uh, off Broadway. And I was doing some publicity and I had to go on the university TV people there. And uh, the publicity girl took me over to this guy and he said, uh, Tell me some, so we haven't got much time now. Uh, tell me something unusual about your career. I said, well, uh, I, I, I was studying to be a CPA. That's what chartered accountant is down south. And uh, I, you don't get paid much when you're a CPA student. I needed to make some money. And one of my, my clients uh, said to me that uh, I should uh, auditioned for the uh, CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and I became the lead in uh, the Jacksons and their neighbors, uh, farm family, and I, that's how I put myself through chartered accountancy. Let me get this straight. <laughs> you put yourself through bookkeeping school by being a professional actor. I said, yeah, you could say that. That'll do. And the, the girl from publicity says, he's Canadian. Oh. <laughs> Tom, that's a reverse of reality. <laughs> it was real. I don't know anybody else who uses a professional acting career to subsidize their, <laughs> their business career. And that was the thing. Wow. Uh, it's been like that ever since. Because quite often you, you get hired to do things, you know, because you're used to moving, moving money around and whatnot. And when I, I like wrote a culture plan for the uh, wow. city of Toronto, it's called Col cultural, Cap cultural Capital, uh, again, it was a, you know, a, a saying what it was going to cost to do this, this, or this, or this, and what other kind of cities were spending, and what what was spending in Europe and things like that. And well, I sent a co sent copies of it to the newspapers and the uh, mayor in Montreal, and he sent me back a nice letter saying thank you. Uh, from uh, the other cultural capital <laughs> and he right away hired somebody to steal my, my entire book and, and do a Montreal version. So the cultural capital study was done in the early 80s, if I believe? Uh, very early, yeah. 1984? Right and you, were you commissioned by the city? Who were you commissioned for to write this report? Uh, eventually it was the city uh, with the, uh, the province. And the idea behind commissioning this report was what? Uh, to take a look at the possibilities for the city of Toronto. And uh, to some extent, give some proof of what could happen, you know. And it was, oh, in Montreal, the, my favorite newspaper there, Un bijou non document. A jewel of a document. I thought, ooh, that's as good as you get in Montreal. I seem to remember from my memories of it, and they're vague, that it was the first time I'd heard the idea that actually small amounts of money spent fostering the arts create a large amount of economic activity 
yeah. in a city. Absolutely. And I'd never heard that perspective before. Yeah. yeah. How did you arrive at that idea? Well, as part of the uh, background, you know, for uh, doing the thing, I was in Europe and I met the mayor of Hamburg. No, not Hamburg, uh, Frankfurt. And I said, they tell me you're spending in Canadian money one billion dollars per year here in Frankfurt on culture. He said, yes. We're building museums, we're building this, we're building that, we're building theater, you know. And uh, I said, what got you started? And he said, when I became mayor, I had never met anybody who came voluntarily to Frankfurt. <laughs> they all came on their job or to go to a bank or something. But nobody came to have a good time. Right. So he, that's what, what started, that started me. I said, do you have any idea of how it, what it does for, oh yeah, yes. Many times what, what, what we spend. And how did you actually work out the mechanics of that relationship? Well, I, was, I had a lot of help there from a guy at, uh, in uh, Canada Council. Uh, and he had done a lot of uh, very careful uh, studies of, uh, uh, what, what would you call it, uh, the uh, effect of spending on, on arts and culture. And uh, you, you, with things that already were there, you know, like big, uh, museums and big this and big that and they're very they notice that sort of thing in, in Ottawa because there are so many buildings there and they're only good to go and look at so uh, it uh, it seemed to catch on with a lot of people and actually uh, Mr. Boychuk who was a very right-wing uh, guy here on the uh, city council, he backed us. I couldn't believe it. He said, well, if they're going to spend five dollars and get back a hundred, that's okay with me. Right. And uh, he, uh, he, because we were afraid he was going to, you know, like take the whole right of the council away and uh, they would never get a chance to expand. And, but he, he backed it and I forget who it was, somebody on the left, whoa, on the left, she actually, uh, she, Dorothy, she actually backed it because she was against big, you know, uh, uh -huh. organizations handling money for the arts. I've but, heard this argument now repeated by Formula One racing, repeated by, it's used by a mm -hmm. whole number of groups now. Yeah. Give us a little bit of money and look how much money you get back. It's, it, it's been taken away from its original purpose, it seems to me, and mm -hmm. been, been cranked up a bit. Well, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, a lot of things, if you do them and offer them for nothing, a lot of people come. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, we used to use as, as an argument, Carabana, yep. you know? You put on for very little actual money from the city. But boy, oh boy, folks came out and the folks had to eat and the folks had to this and that. It's interesting the timing if you did it in 1984 because it was the beginning of the shift away from progressive politics more to conservative politics and more to, okay, we're going to cut deficits and we're going to cut spending and why are we spending all that money on arts, museums, public broadcasters, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so it was a well placed argument, economic argument, let alone the worth of arts in itself, yeah. but an economic argument as we started to go, as we started to shift to the right, mm -hmm. and then everything became evaluated, the money that it makes or returns. Well, it's, it's, it's very hard for some people to see the, the reality of things like a play that when it's over, it's not there anymore, right? It's a wonderful production on Sunday at Tarragon of uh, 
rare. The kids with Down's syndrome are all actors. Remarkable, you know. But when it's over, all you've got is an empty stage, right? But we took a taxi there, we took a taxi home, we paid into this and that, we bought something to drink and this and that, you know. Yep. They don't understand that, that, that something can be very real, even though it's, it looks as though you can see through it.